Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome back to um, the Agronomy Week. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome back to, to the Agronomy Week. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm David Wilson. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for HDE Potatoes for East Anglia in the Southeast. Um, I hope you're enjoying Agronomy Week so far, and um, we've got a fantastic session coming up for you just now, focusing on aphids and virus control. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Jane Thomas, um, who is the, the um, an entomologist um, and the NIAB lead um, for a project we're doing on um, non-persistent virus control in potatoes. Um, and also we have uh, Brice Dupuy, who is the head of Potato R&D at Agriscope, um, who will be presenting later on. Um, we've got some great content and as mentioned in the housekeeping, um, be very grateful if you can put your questions through. Um, if we have time, we'll have some questions between speakers, um, but we will also have a Q&A with everyone at the end. Um, today we are going to start with um, Jane Thomas, as I've mentioned. Um, Jane is um, leading a project um, that we've um, commissioned, um, evaluating the effectiveness of, of aphid management programmes and minimising the spread of non-persistent viruses in potato seed crops in Great Britain. Um, this project is, is being led by SRUC um, and there was two experiments planned for 2020, one in Scotland um, and one with NIAB at Cambridge. Um, unfortunately, due to the, the COVID restrictions, the experiment in Scotland has been postponed until 2021. Um, Jane has completed the, the first season of field research on methods to control PVY transmission by aphids. Um, with high aphid pressure at the trial site in NIAB, um, the treatments have been given a severe challenge. So I would now um, like to invite Jane onto screen um, to share with us uh, some of our findings from this season. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a, a very brief update um, on the work that we've been doing, which I'm afraid isn't, isn't quite finished yet, um, but I can share some of the results with you uh, that we've seen this year. Um, just to go back a little bit, um, this is the, the second project that we've carried out on, on mineral oil sprays and their ability or not to reduce the incidence of potiviruses in seed crops. Um, the first project was a collaboration led by Eric Anderson um, and we had three years um, worth of, of work then. And we did find that the mineral oils we used, which was only H, um, could significantly reduce the incidence um, of potiviruses in seed crops. And there's just three years worth of um, the Cambridge site there, um, looking at levels of PVYN. And you can see in 2011, we had no significant effect of, of OLEH at all, and no significant effect, as you would expect, of the insecticide program that we used. 2012 was rather different. There was a significant effect of the OLEH and nothing from the insecticides. And then in 2013, we had really high um, vector and virus pressure 
um, very high levels in the untreated, but we still saw a significant reduction with the OLEH and no reduction with the insecticide program. So the effects varied between sites and seasons. Um, and in some cases, as you can see there, there was no reduction of, of virus transmission. We also observed some stunting and scorching with the mineral oil that we used, but the plants recovered well. And we actually had the crop inspectors come to look at the trials and eventually they concluded that oil sprays didn't adversely um, affect their ability to um, inspect seed crops. Um, now, in R449, the first sprays were applied between 50 and 75% emergence and continued weekly for nine weeks. And that meant that some plant material was unprotected at very early growth stages and after burn down. And since that project was completed, there's been some research from, from other countries um, published which has prompted further questions on the timing of those initial sprays, the total number of sprays, and some alternative control methods have been investigated as well. So the current work um, aims to investigate both the timing and frequency of mineral oil sprays, the type of mineral oil, and also a look at, at two cultural control options. So our experimental approach was very much the same as in, in the first project. Um, we've got four row plots. Um, in this case, we used Maris Piper, and there's a PVY infector row that you can see in green each side of the plot. There are eight treatments and five replicates per treatment. Uh, we used some yellow water traps at each corner, and then the trial was, was harvested, uh, total yield and, and graded yields. Um, and we're currently uh, doing the ELISA tests to determine virus incidence in harvested tubers. So as was said earlier, uh, the trial was done um, Cambridge 2020, where we do expect high vector pressure, and indeed we, we got it. Um, and in Scotland, it will be done next year, and we expect some contrasting vector pressure there. So our treatment summary, um, untreated and then insecticides only. So we used a, a full legal program. So this was uh, Sumi Alpha and Hallmark Xeon. And then we triggered um, additional sprays if the yellow water trap catches um, indicated that we should. And those were to Pecky, Insist, and then moving to um, Mavento um, after flowering. Um, we kept in OLEH plus um, integrated with a, an insecticide program to really allow us some comparability with the previous work. We then had crop spray 11E, which can be used up to tuber initiation and then switched to an insecticide program. And then we've used some um, additional um, oil products. Uh, product by the name of Reaper. It's called Basile Y in France. And we used that together with an insecticide program. We used it on its own throughout the season. And then we combined it with two cultural approaches. One was the use of a straw ground cover, which um, may help to confuse the aphids and reduce the distinction between um, the plant and, and the ground and deter them from, from landing on the crop. And then we also used Reaper in conjunction with a, an intercrop. We used vetch and really looking at this to see whether it forms A, some sort of barrier or B, potentially um, a stylet cleansing effect to add to the oil effect. OK, so some, some observations from the trial then. Um, we used straw at wheat straw at five tons per hectare, and that stayed in place despite some, some very high winds. And our vetch established pretty well, quite slow at first, but then growing through the canopy. And eventually you can see flowering well there above the canopy at the end of the season. Uh, we use pre-emergence stomp only as a herbicide, and that is vetch safe, so um, that was okay. 
There's the trial um, five days after, after burn down. We flailed on 19th of August. Um, and then two applications of, of spotlight um, after that, and we got a really good um, burn down. Uh, we did continue the oil sprays um, after burn down, so any slight presence of green material still had a, an oil spray over it, and the trial was harvested um, on the 4th of September. So we took uh, then two tubers from each plant in the two centre rows for our ELISA test. And then the remaining tubers in the plot, two central rows were, were lifted for yield and grading. So some, some crop data then, we did a couple of um, in-season uh, measurements, plant height and percentage of plants flowering. And there was no statistically significant effect of any of the treatments on plant height. There were some minor differences, but they weren't significant. Uh, but we did see a significant reduction in, in flowering uh, when vetch was combined with the, the reaper treatment compared to, to reaper alone. And potentially this is because the vetch was just creating a, a lot of competition um, with the crop and somehow uh, reducing the, the progress of its growth. Um, now, interestingly, we saw no clear phytotoxicity with any of the oil treatments, and this was in, in contrast to, to what we saw before. Um, and I think in this slide, I hope you can just see by the white arrow, there's one leaf um, in a reaper spray plot, which has some brown markings um, running down the, the leaf veins where the, the oil has left a little trace of um, the application. But that really was the only uh, potential phytotoxicity that we saw. So really just didn't happen this year. Uh, we don't really understand why. Um, potentially it's variety um, and weather orientated, but no phytotoxic effects. So that was encouraging. OK, so moving on to, to harvest then. Um, we looked at tuber number, um, seed grade yield, and then, then total yield. There were some, some small tubers there which, which didn't make the seed grade yield threshold, so we um, discarded those. Um, but the treatments had no statistically significant effect on tuber number compared to the untreated. There do look to be some differences there, but they were not significant. Um, but the reaper and the reaper with the vetch did significantly reduce total and, and seed grade yields compared to the untreated. And the biggest reduction there was with the, the reaper and the vetch. So again, I think this is really because the vetch was, was competing um, with the crop and, and giving those reductions. Okay, to look at the um, vector pressure we had, um, as you can see, um, we had this massive peak of, of, of vectors um, in late May, um, and then it did tail off, but there were still quite a few um, PVY vectors around right throughout the season. 30% um, emergence was reached um, on the, the 19th of May from a, a mid-April plant. And our first spray went on on the 20th. So that was, was absolutely spot on, really. And then the second spray, 27th. And then they continued um, pretty much at six to seven day intervals um, throughout the rest of the season. We tested all our infectors again. And in the, the area of the, the crop, the area of the trial that we planted, uh, we had PVYOC um, at 14% and PVYN um, at 2%. So um, unfortunately, we are not yet through the post-harvest virus testing. We've got about a third of the trial um, still to test. Um, so I have no virus results. Um, and then they will have to be looked at pretty carefully by the statisticians. And we aim to have our report to AHDB um, scheduled for the, the end of March 2021. Um, as I've said, the trial will be repeated in Scotland um, next year to achieve that contrasting pressure. The actual infector pressure is going to be the same, but we clearly expect much lower vector pressure. So the products will be 
tested in two very different um, contrasting situations. And finally, um, just to acknowledge everybody in, in, involved in the project um, at SIUC, um, Christoph Lacombe at SASA, BIOS who are doing all the statistics, AHDB for, for funding and all the industry people who've given us ad advice and access to trial products as well. And just a, a special thank you to the, the trials team um, at NIAB who kept going with the, the spray program in some, some quite challenging um, windy conditions. So thanks to them. Okay, that's it. Um, are there any questions now or, or later? Um, well, one one quick question, Jane, um, and it's it's in relation to the um, the trial you've done. You mentioned that the lack of um, phytotoxic damage was that quite a common thing you were seeing across other trials th this year. Um, perhaps other work you're doing. Um, I mean, no, no other work with with oils um, that we're doing. Um, it was it was just surprising that we we saw really nothing. Um, and with the 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 first set of trials that we did back 2011 to 2014 um, it was very striking um, we used estima then so i suspect there is a, a variety element to the phytotox um, we did screen a number of varieties in in the last project and there were some some differences um, sunshine was potentially implicated, though we could never quite prove that with uh, an interaction with OLH. Um, but I guess, yeah, it certainly was sunny certain times when we sprayed, but we, we just didn't see that effect. The canopy sort of got weighed down a little bit, um, but it soon recovered, you know, within a, a few hours of, of the sprays going on. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Jane. Um, in the interest of time, we will move on to, to Brees, but we'll come back at the end for a Q&A. So if you're happy to stay with us, um, that's great. So having um, had a, an insight in some of the, the trial work and, and research going on at a UK level, um, we are delighted to be joined by um, Brees Dupuy, um, who is, the, as I mentioned, the head of um, Potato R&D at Agriscope, um, the Institute for Plant Production Sciences in Switzerland. Um, We've asked him to, to come along and, and describe some of the, the aphid control and seed potatoes in Europe. Um, Brees and his, his collaborators, they've recognised that the need for a combination of both chemical and non-chemical methods, um, an approach which has been assisted by their research. Um, his work on viruses includes um, the resistance of different potato varieties, um, knowledge of seed certification schemes, molecular diagnostics, um, virus movement within plants, um, and mechanisms to reduce the spread of aphids. So it's quite a comprehensive um, presentation. Um, we are delighted to be joined by, by Brees, um, and I will now hand over to you to run us through some of your findings. Okay, thank you, David. Um, good afternoon to, to everyone. So, um, and thanks to AHDB to give me the opportunity to present uh, the results of 10 years of research in Switzerland uh, regarding PVY control. And I, I hope that you will all, all of you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Research Center in Switzerland, and I will present you today an overview of the best practices for the control of potato virus Y in potato crops. First of all, I would like to start by a presentation of the PVY pathosystem. It can be presented as a pyramid with four summits, which, which, uh, which are the main components of the pathosystem. We have Firstly, the PVY strains, uh, which is the virus. Then we have the host with the different potato cultivars. Then, of course, we have the vector, uh, the different aphid species. And then we have the environment of the field. And then you can see that all those components are interacting with each other by a certain way. We will start by presenting the first component, the PVY strain. There are seven main PVY strains known um, in Europe, which are PVY O, C, Z, N, E, NTN, and N-Vilga. 
In terms of PVY control, there is no big matter by knowing which kind of uh, PVY strain you have in your field. Uh, but the very important thing here is the main characteristic of this potivirus, which is that it is a non-persistent virus. It means that the acquisition of the virus comes very quick. It's just a matter, matter of a few seconds. And then the aphid, after virus acquisition, will be immediately able to transmit the virus to a healthy plant. It is the reason why, in most of the cases, insecticides are not very efficient in controlling the virus. Looking at all the trials uh, presented in the literature, uh, I did a study of 19 of them. The average efficacy of insecticide is about 8%. So it is very low compared to the other existing control methods to control PVY. But having said that, we don't have to forget that the insecticide can be efficient in controlling other viruses, such as the persistent viruses and in, the, in those persistent viruses, we have the potato leaf roll virus, which is quite present in Europe. And we have the different aphid species as vectors for PVY. There are more than 70 aphid species able to transmit the virus. Each species has a different relative efficacy of uh, virus transmission. The most efficient known so far is Mysos, Mysos. To give another example, for example, Brachycodus elytrisi, uh, which is the sunflower aphid, has only 22% of the efficacy of transmission of uh, Mysos persici. But this is one aspect, but we have also to consider another aspect, which is the behavior of the aphid. And then we can distinguish two main groups. First, the colonizing aphids, so the list over here. And then we have the so-called itinerant aphids. And these aphids are not potato aphids, so they will not establish on potatoes. For example, here we have a winged aphid of the species Mysus persici coming into uh, landing on a potato field. He will visit a first plant, maybe transmit the virus. He will not establish there because he will see other colonies, for example. And then he will fly to another plant. And then he will stop, establish, feed on it, and uh, create his own colony. And then he won't move um, so much into the plot. And uh, it's not a big danger, a big risk of transmission. At the opposite, we have the so-called itinerant aphids, for example, Brachycodus elicrisi. He will land on, on the potato field and will start to probe on the first plant. Of course, he, he will notice that it's not a sunflower, it's summer host, so he will fly to another plant and so on. And in this representation, for example, he will visit seven different plants before leaving the plot. We can understand here that the, the risk of transmission is quite higher, even if the efficacy of transmission of this aphid species is not very high. To, get, to have a good evaluation of the risk, the best thing is to have a good model adapted to, to the condition of your area, integrating all those aspects to know exactly at which time the risk of transmission is the highest. And then we move the host, the plant. Uh, we can distinguish uh, susceptible cultivars, resistant cultivars. It is quite interesting to note that some cultivar can be resistant to one strain. For example, Agria is quite resistant to PVY and TN, but very susceptible to PVY and Vilga, for example. There are also tolerant cultivars. I think that there are quite few. Uh, one known cultivar is uh, the cultivar Red La Soda, uh, a US cultivar. In those cultivars, the, they can be infected. The virus will accumulate into the plants. 
and uh, but they will not show symptoms and you will not have a yield reduction. But those cultivars are representing a risk in terms of virus reservoir in the environment. And finally, we have the mature plant resistance. This is a phenomenon present in barely all cultivars in which we will observe an, an increase of the resistance of the plants to time. It is represented here very clearly. At the early stage of the plants, you can see that you have, in case of high uh, infection pressure, you will have a lot of new infection until on average 45 days, and then you will have less new infection coming in. And after 65, 70 days, you will have no new infection at all, meaning that the plant became totally resistant to the new infections. This is very important to understand that at the early stage of the plants, uh, after emergence and for a few weeks, the plant is very susceptible to the, the infection and those stages are very critical. So here you have four pictures of um, example of uh, symptoms that you can have of potato plants due to PVY. And finally, the last summit of the pyramid is the environment. In the environment, we have to consider first uh, the environment as a reservoir of inoculum. For example, if you have your seed potato field surrounded in the area by rare potato fields with a high uh, level of uh, PVY in it, uh, it is of high risk. If its populations are also very important, uh, and those populations are regulated by different factors, one of those factors is, of course, the temperature. At low average temperature, you will have less aphids. Wind is also an important uh, factor because if you have your field close to the sea, you have high wind and the aphid cannot control its flight and so you are less exposed to the infections. High grade regions have been defined. Uh, for UK it is of course uh, uh, Scotland, for continental Europe it is more in the Scandinavian countries. In those regions, the conditions are quite favorable for seed potato production and we try to protect them. But as you can see on this map, the climate of Scotland is quite changing. In the recent years, we have observed that um, it's getting warmer. And it can be that in the near future, the aphid population will increase and represent a higher risk for seed potato crops. So uh, then we will come back to our pyramid and we will add to the pyramid uh, those uh, yellow circles presenting the existing control method against the spread of PVY in the field. I will not go further in details with all those methods. I will focus on three of them. Uh, the first one is oil spraying, which is the most popular um, PVY control method in the continental Europe. Then I will continue uh, by uh, exposing you mulching and border crops uh, as uh, control methods. So we start with um, oil spraying. What are the main principles? The mode of action of oils is not very well known. It is suspected that it acts uh, as a contact. The, they may have some problems of phytotoxicity and uh, yield reduction, but those phenomena are quite uh, rare. But there are some limitations uh, linked with the use of um, oil and mineral oils in this case. It is to know that um, at the early stage of the plant, uh, mineral oil is has a relatively low efficacy. Why is it so? For example, here you have a plant uh, just a few days after emergence, then you will come with your sprayer, you will um, apply the mineral oil on the top of it, so I have represented that with the blue color here, and then we will, you will wait for seven years 
before coming back with your sprayer. Seven years later, your plant will look a little bit like this. You have uh, the protected leaves at the bottom, and then you have the new leaves on the top of the plant, very exposed to aphids uh, landing. And so these, uh, these leaves are very susceptible because remember that at early stage, the plant is very susceptible to PVY infection. So at this stage, the risk is very high. Later on in the season, the proportion of protected leaves compared to the un unprotected one will be higher, will be higher. So it means that the prob probability for an aphid to land on unprotected leaves will be uh, quite lower. Meaning why there is an, an efficacy increase of mineral oil through time. So the efficacy of mineral oil is considered as highly variable and rely on the type of oil. So it is recommended to use uh, paraffinic oils. To give an example, we have compared the efficacy of paraffinic oil with the efficacy of rapeseed oil. And we have observed that those vegetable oils had 50% um, less efficacy compared to mineral oil. So those vegetable oils are not very interesting in terms of efficacy. The timing of aphid flight is very important as well. The dosage of oil may have an effect and the frequency of treatment is also important. But I will come back on this in the next slide. Here you have a chart presenting the efficacy of PVY control of mineral oil tested during nine years in our research institute. And the interesting thing here is that we have used exactly the same experimental design for all these years. So we can compare them to compare them to each other. And you can see that we had a, a high variability of efficacy going from 25 until 67% of efficacy with an average of efficacy of uh, 40%. So 40% is much higher than insecticide with 8%, but um, it could be better. And there are some possibilities by for increasing the efficacy of mineral oil treatment by increasing the frequency of treatment at the early stage of the plant. So here in this table, you have an example of um, a mineral oil treatment strategy used in France to control PVY spread in seed potato fields. You can see that from 30% of emergence until 100% of emergence, they come with oil spraying every three days. So at this stage, the frequency of treatment is very high. There are some uh, experimental results here published in this presentation, in this publication of uh, Fageria. You can see that with coming with all treatments every three days, you will have a better protection compared to coming every week or every 10 days. And another interesting thing on this chart is that they didn't have a better efficacy by applying 15 liters compared to half of that 7.5 liters. So I cannot tell you, for example, in this table, if it's better to use 15 or 12 liters per hectare. We were using in our experiment seven liters, but we did not test other um, amounts. So this should be down in other, done in other experiments. So now we will move to another treatment uh, method, uh, with, which is um, the application of straw on the fields. But before that, here you have a representation of the evolution of the efficacy of mineral oil through time. You can see that the, at the early stage of the plant, the efficacy of mineral oil is relatively low. 
and then it will increase through time. If you apply a higher frequency of treatments in the at the early stage of the plant, you would have something uh, like that with a better uh, efficacy for this critical period uh, for the potato crop. Now we can move to straw mulching. Uh, what are the principles of this technique? The mode of action of straw mulching is not very well known. What we know is that we have less winged aphids landing on the plots presenting straw. So we have observed that many times in our trials. The straw is most probably reducing the contrast between the plant and uh, the soil. For, for us, for us, our human view, it's not quite clear because we can perfect see, perfectly see the contrast between the straw and the plant in this picture, for example. But the vision of the aphids is, of course, different from ours. We know that aphids are attracted by green, but we also know that they are also attracted by yellow. So what they see would be more something like that. So plants on bare soil, they can spot them quite easily compared to potato plants with a soil covered by straw because they are interested by both. So they will, there is a probability that they will land on the straw, then they will probe. Of course, they will note that, that they don't like it and they will fly away and leave the plot. So this is the theory of the effect of uh, straw mulching. But in practice, how does it work? So here you have pictures of one of our trials. So you can see here the plants emerging in the, in the straw and then they are growing after one week, two weeks. And you can see that after four to five weeks, the rows will be covered by the potato canopy. And at this time, the straw is not visible and it won't, it will lose all efficacy in terms of PVY control. We can see that quite clearly here on, on this graph, uh, we have the number of aphids captured in the two plots. And you can see that for the first four weeks, we captured less aphids in the plots with uh, straw on the soil compared to bare soil plots. But at five and six uh, weeks, the number of capture is on average the same. In terms of efficacy, the efficacy of straw is uh, quite variable as well, and depends on the type of straw, the timing of if it's light, the quantity of straw you put in the field. We have done some tests about that, and the minimum quantity is 2.5 tons per hectare and the rapidity of row closure is also important. So here you have the results of seven years of experiments presenting the efficacy of PUI control of uh, straw. And you can see that for some years, we had 0% of efficacy. It is when the aphids uh, flight came after row closure. And for some years, we have we had up to 61% of efficacy. It is when the main aphid flies came before row closure, just after emergence. And the average efficacy is quite low, 25%. But remember, it's much higher than um, insecticide. <clears throat> so this would be the evolution of the efficacy of protection through time of uh, straw mulching, so it is relatively efficient early in the season, and then it will drop down at row uh, covering and to go to zero efficacy after uh, total covering of the rows by the potato canopy. Why? How would it be if we combine straw mulching with mineral oil treatments? It would be something like that because straw mulching will be efficient in, in the beginning, and then oil will take over for the later stage of the, of the season, and then you would have a, a quite stable protection through time. 
And we have some uh, evidence of that with uh, a lot of data because we have experimented both treatments together for six years, and it is presented here. And you can see that if we are using in this uh, uh, light green here, both methods together, we had from 50% until 73% of efficacy. So it's much more stable compared to mineral oil and uh, straw melting used alone. And interestingly, we always had a better efficacy than the treatments alone, systematically. And the average efficacy is of 63%, uh, which is quite high compared to mineral oil used alone, uh, which is 40%. So there is a big interest here to have a good protection for early and late flights, and then you will have a reduced risk of downgrading or rejection of seed lots uh, due to virus infection. You will ask, you, maybe you will ask me, is it already used somewhere in Europe? And the answer is no, I would say not yet. Why? Because this technology is quite new because the, eff the effect of the combination of mineral oil and straw mulching was firstly demonstrated in 2017. So it's quite recent. And the French growers, HZPC France, have started the first experiment in the field at the, la at the larger scale uh, this year. And you can see here the pictures, how they did. They put with this machine about five tons of straw per hectare. You can see here the plants growing. And then the situation just before harvest, when the, the straw is quite well decomposed and uh, does not cause big problems uh, at harvest. And they are quite convinced of the interest of the method. And they have decided to make more experiments uh, next year with 20 hectares of experiment with straw and mineral oil. And then I will finish with the crop border technique. The mode of action of this PVY control strategy is better known. Uh, the first element of action is that the border crop will act as an aphid barrier. It is clear that the winged aphid coming into the plot, the potato field, will first be in contact with the border. So it will land on, on it. And the second uh, mode of action is the border crop as a virus sink. The aphid will probe on the border crop and will lo lose the virus uh, particle by probing on the border crop. And then it will move to the, um, the potato field and will not be infectious anymore. So what kind of characteristics do we need for the border crop? It has to be a non-host non plant for PVY, of course. It has to be in place before the potatoes. Uh, so the better situation is when the border crop is already present at emergence uh, to be efficient uh, at the early stages, and it has to be wide enough. So we did not experiment border crops in Switzerland, but there are some interesting elements uh, in the literature. There were some trials performed in Canada and uh, in the US. These are the results obtained in Canada. I have tried to present them uh, by a similar way compared to the previous uh, charts. So you have the efficacy of PVY control of uh, mineral oil, border crops, and the combination of both. And you can see that with the combination, they have a, a more stable protection, which is on average uh, 62% compared to mineral oil, uh, for which they had a lot of variation, as we observed, and the same for border crops. The problem is, to me, uh, that they have only three years of experiments. So maybe it's too low, because we are not sure that they 
have experimented uh, these kind of border crops with early aphid flights, middle and late aphid flights. So the experimental design they use was a border of four meters with using um, potato and more specifically the not susceptible uh, cultivar Kennebec. And in the center, of course, they, they had a susceptible cultivar. In the US, they did similar experiments with potato and soybean as border crop, and they have observed that the efficacy of both crops were quite similar. I think that before using this technology in a larger scale, there is a need for additional data to know exactly what would be the best plant uh, for the border, what would be the best width for the border as well, because they use four meters, but is it optimal? We don't know. And uh, what would be the efficacy for early aphid flights? Because my worry is that if you are using, for example, soybean and potatoes, at potato emerge, other will be there yet. So maybe with other crops, it would be better if they are already well established at potato emergence to have a better effect. But this has never been tested so far. And would it be interesting to do treatments or maybe necessary to do, for, to do, for example, insecticide treatments in the border crops in case of aphids colonies would, would establish in those borders? So we come back to the PVY pathosystem representation with the different existing uh, control uh, strategies. And I have done some bibliographic study to evaluate the average efficacy of those different strategies. And it is interesting uh, to have those values, of course, but also to know a bit more about the evolution of the protection through time. So we have seen that with mineral oil, the protection is increasing during the growing season. It's, uh, it is shown by this. Uh, green arrow going up. For mulching, it is the opposite. Uh, it is, the efficacy is decreasing through time. It is why those two strategies are very complementary. And you can see his, here the reduction of the efficacy by the red arrow going down. But there are other strategies that you are most probably using um, uh, every day, such as logging and early home killing, for example. Of course, uh, we have to continue to do those, uh, to take those prophylactic measures. And I would like to finish my presentation by presenting four very different uh, situations and to try to think a little bit about the, the best practices in terms of PUI control to be used for each one of the situation. The worst case scenario would be this situation. So you are cultivating a very susceptible cultivar and you are in an area with a high aphid pressure or a certain year with a high aphid pressure. In this case, I would recommend to do an intensive mineral oil treatment uh, by also by splitting the treatment early uh, in the season to have a better uh, efficacy. And I would recommend to complement that uh, with another technique, for example, straw mulching that we know very well, or maybe by uh, with border crops. And of course, you continue to do all the prophylactic measures such as rogging and early on killing. So we have observed this year in some region such as north of France and Switzerland, for example, that mineral oil um, uh, treatments, even with a higher frequency, frequency early in the season, were not enough to control PVY in susceptible cultivar. So it is the reason why I think that a complement should be useful in those cases. And then we have two other situation uh, quite similar in terms of risk. The first one is you are 
cultivating a, a cultivar which is not too susceptible to PVY, but in a high acid pressure area, or another situation, you have a quite a very susceptible cultivar cultivated in a low acid pressure area, for example, in, uh, in Scotland. And for in those situations, I would recommend to do regular mineral oil treatments to complement with straw mulching or border crops, uh, for example, for pre-basic seed or for any other high value crop that you consider as such. And then, of course, you do all prophylactic measures, rogging and early oak killing. And at the end, we have the best, most comfortable situation for which you have um, less susceptible um, cultivar and you have a low effort pressure, um, for example, in Scotland. And then I will recommend to do regular mineral oil treatment for pre basic seed. And I would recommend to do regular mineral oil treatment at least until flowering for basic and certified seed. Because we know that before flowering, remember the potato is not, um, is very susceptible to, due to the absence, absence of major plant resistance. And then of course, rubbing and uh, early home killing are still necessary. So this, this was my last slide. <laughs> If you want more information uh, regarding PVY in general, you can purchase this book, for example. Uh, this book was directed by Christophe Lacombe from SASA. And if you want more interact, uh, information regarding PVY uh, control per se, you can download for free my PhD thesis uh, at this um, internet address in which you will have almost all the information uh, presented in this presentation and everything is in English. These are all the references uh, used um, in this presentation and I thank for your attention. Fantastic stuff there, Brice. Um, yeah, real fascinating stuff. Um, a quick question just for yourself before we bring Jane back into it. Um, it is one around, um, apologies if you touch on it, but um, willow carrot aphid in PVY transmission, um, given its res resistance status to pyrethroids, um, how important um, it, are you finding yeah, willow carrot aphid on the continent? Mm -hmm. what, I, I can, what I can say about this aphid is that it's... Um, it's not a potato aphid, of course, um, and uh, its efficacy of transmission is relatively low, 20% uh, compared to Mises persicae. Um, its role in um, uh, in terms of infection in um, in potato field can be compared to any other um, uh, not potato aphid, I would say, but of course the amount of aphid can play uh, an important role in terms of transmission. So in the case of you, you have uh, wear potato field surrounding your seed potato field and uh, um, uh, rapid multiplication of this species in those fields due to the, the phenomenon of uh, resistance, they can represent the risk in your potato crop, of course. But uh, I don't have any specific data E for each aphid species. No, no problem. And if, if we could ask Jane to, to join us as well, just for some, some sort of general um, scene setting for everything that, that's gone before, um, what sort of species of aphids were, were being caught in your traps, Jane? What was it, numbers and species were you finding? It, it was principally Mises persicae. Um, I mean, there were other species, and there was a, a, a big peak of of cabbage aphid um, quite late in the season. But the the early peaks were really dominated by Mises persicae. So, yeah. uh, and in in that trial, did you have a control where there, there was no aphicide, but you used infected plants, or did did everything get yeah, up? Yeah, no, uh, there was a completely untreated untreated plots which had infectors by the side of them so 
um, yeah, that was completely untreated. And then one other thing is, is the big difference between um, the continent and, and mainland um, UK is um, the registration around these products. Um, are we currently allowed to use any vegetable oils um, in potatoes in the UK? Uh, no, I, I think that, <laughs> that's the, the short answer. So, I mean, yeah. crop, crop spray 11E is um, used up until tuber initiation, but as I understand, it's not not directly as a as a, a, a vector control um, option. Um, so, um, and we have talked to. Um, Desan Goss, who are responsible for, for Reaper, so they are looking to get their product um, through the registration process, but it's yeah. it's quite a, a lengthy um, procedure. So I think um, they're saying 2022 at the, the earliest. Right, and I suppose not one to put you on the spot because I know you're you're by no means in charge of, of um, regulatory processes and registrations, but um, how many OLEH treatments would you expect to be permitted? Um, and would that only be before tuber initiation? I don't know if you want to add on that, Brees, what your experience I, of? I, I don't know, actually. Yeah. I, don't, have to, I don't know. For OLEH. From use of products, Brees, would you, would you expect them to be before tuber initiation only? Um, personally, I, I don't know. I can just tell you uh, what uh, we are doing in continental Europe. So in in uh, France, Belgium, Netherlands, they are intensively uh, treating with uh, mineral oils. And uh, I had shown you uh, some uh, treatment schemes uh, in which they come every three days at the early stage of the, uh, of the plant with mineral oils. Uh, in Germany, in the past, they were not allowed to use uh, mineral oil, so they were relying on insecticide. But in their situation, the main seed potato crops are really in the north and in areas very uh, far from anywhere potato production. So the, the pressure was uh, relatively low, but the pressure is increasing and they are allowed to use uh, mineral oils as the other countries in the same quantity since last year. So they have this, a solution. And I think that uh, in the UK, uh, the best way would be to 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 put the pressure <laughs> to get the, the possibility to, to, to treat as we are doing in continental Europe. And um, I think that at the moment in Scotland, uh, they are quite still preserved, but what would it be uh, in, in the, the next 10, 10 years, we don't know. So, yeah. Um, a question that's coming actually for, for, for both speakers here. Um, since that no control methods um, give control, um, even with um, careful scientists, should pre-basic growers be using a fine mesh to cover their crops? So rather than treating a problem, should we be preventing it? and keeping virus out from the beginning so there's nothing for aphids to spread? Yeah, it's, it is interesting because um, they have tested that uh, in France uh, uh, this year. Uh, but the, the, the problem for that, it, it is very, very expensive. Uh, so it has to be used just for the, the first generation uh, in the field when you have a very low surface. And uh, technically, um, it's not totally ready yet. Um, so they, they were using techniques used for vegetables to put the net on the, on the potatoes. Uh, of course, when it is properly done, the efficacy is 100% in terms of protection because the, the, the aphids the, do not have any access. But you can be facing other problems such as higher temperature under the net for the potatoes. So you have to adapt a little bit the strategies uh, to that. But the the main point is that it, it, it will it would be quite expensive to do so. I, I, I think that's uh, uh, the same as um, the view over here. So um, David Furman, um, when he was at, at Cuff, did some experiments with um, insect mesh. Um, and got you know a really big reduction in 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 virus in in the harvested tubers, um, 
but it was only on a, a small scale and yes it, it would be expensive it wasn't completely effective but it was very very effective um but yeah expense and also i think um keeping the nets on the canopy um so um i think from, from pictures i've seen the canopy did get sort of quite tight um underneath the nets so there's a, a management um aspect to it as well so that you don't sort of squash the plants too much yeah is it from both yeah, anything i've pictures i've seen in the past has almost been sort of hurdles put underneath the the net to keep it off the crop so it doesn't get too yeah. warm yeah but then yeah. also you need to manage the canopy underneath it so it's not getting squashed yeah um but yes yeah, so sticking on uh, so going away slightly from the chemical side we've talked about and, and more of a an ipm um approach that um it's starting with them um, with clean seed um, I suppose one of the key things, and um, is could you, do you think you could successfully grow high grade seed with low virus and its progeny tubers in England, given the high vector pressure and the environmental inoculum pressure? So if you almost start with zero in the seed and you're only what can be brought in, do you think that could be achieved? Um, maybe without, uh, without mineral oil in enough quantity, I think that it would be quite complicated. And because you touched on um, Brice about um, using border crops, um, so if you had a border crop of a resistant potato, um, would you apply um, oils to the border as well, or would you allow the allow the aphids to probe as mm -hmm. much as they want and almost clear is, out the virus? Yeah, this is a good question because in the in the publication of the Canadian, you can find the reference uh, in the in the slides. They have tested uh, both kind of uh, borders treated with mineral oil and the other one uh, not. The, in the results that I have, I have presented in, a, in the slide, it was uh, with mineral oil treatment on the border uh, crops. Um, in terms of results, if I remember the difference um, of uh, PVY infection into the field uh, was not very high for both uh, treatments. And they did not comment too, not too much on the the opportunity to to do uh, mineral oil treatments of the border or maybe you can also imagine uh, insecticide treatments of the uh, in the borders because if you are for example using a border that is not a potato crop maybe so some if it's special can will be able to multiply in it and represent a risk for the the potatoes themselves so as a general conclusion for that i think that for border crops there is something interesting uh, because it is quite uh, easy to implement. We don't have tested that in Switzerland because in Switzerland our potato fields are very small, so <laughs> we couldn't find pl place enough to put the, the border, so it, it was not my pr priority. But additional research and I needed to know uh, uh, what size for the border. They have tested four meters, but uh, maybe more would, be, uh, would have a better effect. Uh, which kind of plan, plan to be used, because if you compare uh, summer or winter crops, I would uh, preferably use winter crops because they would be already well developed at potato emergence compared to, to summer crops. But um, in this case, only summer crops were tested in the US and Canada. So there are no data concerning uh, winter crops. Uh, so I think that before using that, more research are, are needed to, to evaluate the, the efficacy, of course, but also some risk uh, due to the development of uh, aphid population in those crops, for example. And that actually leads us perfectly back to you, Jane. Now, a question has come in about um, the, the vetch, and was that established in time for potato emergence um, to have an effect at the critical early stage? Yes, I mean, I think it, it, it was. I, I think the very early stages, yeah, that there was a, a decent um, growth of the, the vetch crop then. Um, there then seemed to be a bit of a, a lag when the canopy came up quite quickly and the vetch sort of struggled to, to keep up with it and then it sort of equalised again. Uh, but, but very early on, yes, there, there, was a, there was a decent barrier, yeah. And then sticking on barriers, um, Brice, back to you. Um, how hard is it to manage the straw um, that was put on the crop when it comes to harvest? 
Yes, so the, the French guys uh, have tested that, so using uh, five tons of straw per hectare. Um, and uh, at harvest, uh, it was quite, quite well decomposed and they didn't have big uh, problems. But, you know, it was not the, the, I don't know the name in English, but the straw was not completed. It was uh, uh, mashed before oh, mulch, applying yes. uh, sure. uh, on, the, on the field. So it was just small pieces of straw uh, on the soil. And then they decompose quite easily and at harvest uh, there is no problem. In our trials, I have done a, a scale that I have given to the, the technician in the field just to evaluate the facility of harvest using straw or using uh, intercropping uh, with a uh, vetch, for example. And uh, for regarding straw, there was no big matter uh, concerning that. Um. Yeah, that's, that's it's interesting. Um, another question that's come in that actually relates to, to, to both of you was um, around the, the, again, timings of sprays. Um, so Mavento <coughs> was mentioned, um, and I, I know that it's about use of it in flowering crops. Um, I know that there's restrictions on the label saying that um, potatoes that produce flowers that cannot be used till after flowering. Yeah. Um, is this a challenge you have on the continent and how was this taken in, in the trial in the UK, Jane? Um, I mean, we, we, we really just stuck to the, the label um, restrictions for, for those sprays. So that whole program was within label um, yeah. you know, for all the products. So it was, yeah, after flowering. Personally, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no problem at all. Um, well, whilst I've got you on, on, on Brice, um, uh, does anyone spray mineral oil at low rates every two days? So really shortening that interval um, after emergence, do you think that would increase efficacy? Yeah, I, I had some feedback uh, in France uh, in some growers doing that. Um, in terms of efficacy, as I have presented, it's uh, it's it's uh, totally correct because um, uh, compared to the the theory uh, of uh, uh, the efficacy, the evolution of the efficacy of mineral oil treatments, it's very important to to try to protect the plant as it is growing and because the new leaves are not protected, very susceptible on the top of the, of the plant, so very exposed to aphid flight. Uh, so yeah, uh, and th there was an interesting initiative in France in, in terms of uh, research. They, they, but it's an ongoing project, but they are uh, building some models of uh, foliage development of the plant to develop decision support systems of mineral oil treatment uh, 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 corresponding to the speed of the development of the foliage, meaning that for high speed development, they will come uh, more frequent, frequently compared to, for example, uh, some cold days during spring in which the foliage will not develop too much, and then they will uh, switch to a regular uh, treatment every week, for example. And it, it, it is quite in the spirit of uh, the, the best practices is to to, to come with a, a higher frequency when the foliage development is very quick at the early stage of the, the development of the plant. Thank you. Um, back to you, Jane. I'll say conscious of time. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, in in your, your NIAB trial, Jane, um, was the mineral oil applied with blight sprays or applied separately? Uh, separately, yeah. It so the, separately. Yeah, the blight sprays went, went over um, separately. And then one question that someone was most definitely listening and paying attention that puts you on the spot slightly, but um, what can you tell us about Reaper and why do you think alone it reduced yield even without the Vetch's competition? Yeah, that, that I, I don't know. Um, I can't explain that. I, I've, I've looked at that data and yes, there was a reduction, um, but you know, the reduction was so much more when the vetch was there, which you, you can explain because of the competition, but I, I can't actually explain uh, the reduction that we saw with, with Reaper alone. Um, I think, you know, if, if, if the, the virus tests show that there is a, a benefit, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a balance then, isn't it? Some, some yield reduction with, with virus control. So I think the sort of whole story is, is yet to be told. Yeah, it's very much a change in landscape and um, decisions will have to be made. Um, 
Well, one question just to finish on with, with you, Brees, really to, to put you on the spot. Um, if a Swiss uh, seed potato grower was to ask you how to protect his crop from PVY, what would you advise? My situation is terrible because they are not listen, listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> the the yeah, French the, audience. Uh, yeah, the, the, the French and the, 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 the people from UK are, seems to be more interested <laughs> on our research. But now, what I would recommend, of course, um, is to have the best protection uh, at the early stage of the plant with a, a higher frequency of treatment with mineral oil at least if you are allowed to do so, of course. And, and uh, it was what I said in my last slide. So I would complement with an other efficient strategy. So we have a lot of experience with straw mulching, but it, it could be another uh, to protect the, um, the high value crops. I would say the high grades or maybe the varieties for which you have a uh, very few quantity of seed and that you want to maintain uh, as as long as possible, uh, then I would complement. But uh, uh, you have to adapt that adapt that if you are in Scotland or in England, uh, with um, of course not the same uh, aphid pressure. And if you are uh, cultivating um, a very susceptible of or a less susceptible PVY uh, 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 potato varieties, but in Switzerland we are in most of the case in the worst case scenario because almost all our varieties are very susceptible to pvy and we every year we have a, a very high uh, pvy pressure even higher compared to the netherlands to france and to to belgium and germany so it's uh, it's quite a big challenge and uh, i think that after the result, uh, the, the very bad year that we had this year in terms of uh, uh, seed infection by PVY, maybe my growers will uh, better listen to my recommendation in the future. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> That's a good positive note to end on. Thank you both very much, um, Dr. Jane Thomas and Dr. Brice Dupuy. Um, fantastic insight into both um, UK and European work there. Um, we had some, some great stuff, really got people thinking. We had some fantastic questions coming in. Um, that is great. So I'd once again like to thank you both for, for great presentations. Thank you. Thank you. So you will shortly, um, you'll receive, uh, there's a, a survey, sorry, at the bottom of the, um, the, the section here you can click on. Um, don't forget to apply for BASIS and Neuroso. The codes are on screen there with B43B for BASIS and N43B for Neuroso. Um, thank you very much for, for sticking with us throughout the day and um, please join us again for um, a late blight session starting at 5 p.m. Uh, genotypes and resistant varieties. Um, I will be popping up my ugly head again for that one. So thank you all very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure sharing it with you and hopefully see you later. Thank you very much.